Elizabeth, are you waiting for anyone to join us online or can we stream your presentation now and then have a conversation about it? We just don't want anyone to miss it. We are running a little bit early, which is very unusual. I'm fine with it going ahead just now. Okay, great. So we'll stream it now. We've still got um, um, many people in the audience here and a few people online and then we'll have a, a question and answer after we stream it. So thanks. Deeper in this radical possibilities in the artist audience relationship. This constitutes work that I engaged in for my master's and work that I'm continuing with and expanding for my PhD. Um, it's based around issues of labour, audience labour and hierarchies within the avant-garde and in avant-garde music and art and in particular free improvisation. And the title comes from Cornelius Cartus lecture on composition in Rome, where he talks about the need for artists with a social or political conscience to find a way out of the avant-garde so that they can stand with workers. And I'm going to argue that there are possibilities for doing that within the avant-garde. So with that in mind, let us begin. There will be three parts to this talk broadly. The first is work, audience, labour and art and music. Then we have towards a non-hierarchical form, free improvisation and liberation. And what next from self to others? So let's begin with the first section, work. And this is subtitled audience, labour and art and music. So these Topics came about after reading Nicholas Brad's Relational Aesthetics, in which he defines this idea of relational aesthetics as an aesthetic theory consisting in judging artworks on the basis of their interhuman relations, which they present, produce, or prompt. And to an extent, this was a reaction against the commodification of art in the 1980s, such as the work of Jeff Coombs. However, he bemoans at one point the sure instinct to laziness in those unwilling to engage with challenging art. And I would argue that once you bring in the idea of laziness, you also bring in the idea of work, of labour. So it's arguable that what he has done as const constitutes a form of labour and that demands intellectual and even physical labour from audiences. So what kind of labour am I talking about here? Well, I'm talking about aesthetic labour or doing the brand, to borrow the title from Clutcher and Nacho's paper, doing the brand aesthetic labour is situated relational performance and fashion retail. And aesthetic labour are the kind of jobs whereby your employer will determine to some extent how you dress, how you present yourself, how you interact with other people. And you find these in things like fashion retail, as per this paper, or in things like charity work. And Clutcher and Natural say that aesthetic labourers are expected to work on and with their bodies in order to be what Froon McGarvey call an embodied billboard. There's this idea of your body and everything you do with your body being a advertisement for the brand. It's important to this, but another aspect is important, which they discuss in this paper. And that's this idea of doing the brand, this idea of identifying with the brand and choosing to engage and the kind of labour that these fashion outlets want you to. And this is important and will become very important in what I'm talking about in the next few slides, this idea that we can willingly engage in this kind of labour. Now, I'm going to discuss this in relation to an artwork which is actually discussed within the book Relational Aesthetics. But before we begin, I want to think about a quote from Amelie, who's one of the people interviewed 
for this paper and she says it's really hard to explain to a customer how to wear something if you're not wearing it that way yourself. So with that in mind, this is Untitled Portrait of Ross in LA by Felix Gonzalez Therese. And this work consists of a large pile of candies, which individually wrapped candies, which are placed in the corner of a gallery. And your the, the weight of this pile is the weight of an average adult male. In your role, but your job, when you engage with this artwork, is to take one of these candies. You're asked to engage in the physical act of actually taking one, and through this, the pile slowly diminishes, and this mirrors the effect of a person slowly diminishing through illness. This is a, a work about AIDS, about someone the artist knew who died of AIDS. And there are multiple ways of interpreting this artwork and interpreting what means what these candies are. Um, it's often discussed in terms of mutual aid or it's discussed as Gonzalez Therese giving you a gift. And these are all well and good, but Gonzalez Therese is no longer with us. He himself died of AIDS and this work is now presented in a gallery where only last year the gallery staff managed to get unionised to demand basic rights. So with that in mind, what becomes of this process of taking a suite? Is this still mutually, or is this still a gift that Gonzalez Therese has given you? Or does it literally become work? And what does it mean for us to willingly engage and physical labour with no reward. Because the reward in this case is going to the gallery and other works like this it would go to the artist. But we are willingly engaging in this, we're doing the brand and the brand here is the idea of art, of culture, of being a cultured person. You go to a gallery and you do a thing and that shows how cultured you are. But you are like Amelie, in this case, who is showing how to wear the thing, how to enact this idea of culture by doing this act of culture. In your actions, your labour is what's important in this. And with that in mind, I want to turn to another quote from that paper. This is Rory. It says that sometimes we pop on the we pop the clothes on for a bit of a play in front of a selling customer. You would show them how it could be done. Often there was a really difficult piece, like when there were some trousers that were half seized through and they weren't moving at all. So me and my friends were like, these are probably funny. Let's grab them. Let's buy them. Then all of a sudden we sold out of them because people came in and they could see you wearing them, doing them. And there's two things I want to pull out from this, the playfulness. Of it. And also the idea of doing at them, doing a thing. We willingly engage in the act of giving our physical labour to artworks, just as Rory willingly and playfully engages in the act of giving his body over and his labour to the company that employs him. And he wants people to see him doing this and by doing it, he promotes the brand. And there is no real difference between what Rory is doing and what we're doing. We, we engage with these sort of relational artworks. And this couldn't help but remind me of the Society of the Spectacle in which the board says that the economy transforms the world, but it transforms it into a world of the economy. So Everything we do, the jobs we do, our leisure time, when we go to a gallery and appreciate art, all of this becomes work. All of it becomes a function of the economy and there is nothing left but work. There is nothing left but the economy. And in having nothing but the economy, we become nothing but workers. 
And a worker can never become a boss. A worker will always be a worker and we will always be audiences engaging with artworks and with artworks they use our labour to extract meaning from the raw materials. And I consider this inherently a dangerous situation to be in. I wanted to investigate this more. So what I did, and this is now section two, towards a non-hierarchical form, free improvisation in labour. To investigate this and investigate particularly within the field of free improvisation, which is one of the methods that I use as an artist. I chose to host three free improvisations for piano live streamed on YouTube. And these were mediated by the audience who could determine the direction of the improvisation through submitting suggestions to the chat function in real time. So in effect, they were part of the improvisation and what they suggested guided its form and guided what I did. And I wanted to use this model because I thought I overcame some of the issues which I feel are inherent within free improvisation. And these are ideas of practice as a passport. So the idea that the amount of time you've practiced makes you an authority. So you have Simon H. Fell saying that he's practiced improvisation for decades, so therefore he's the next bear on it. Or you have David Toop going even further and saying that he's been doing it his whole life. Or you have the need for virtuosity. So you have Ronnie Scott and Bailey's book in improvisation, Derek Bailey's book, talking about trying to make his instrument sound like a non-instrument or like another instrument. And you also have Bailey talking about the development of instrumental techniques. And all of these are relying on virtuosity, they're relying on the practice that you put on your instrument and your skill with your instrument. You also have mysticism. So you've Evan Parker in Bailey's book talking about trans and whimsy, or you have Rod Patton talking about how when you engage in free improvisation, you can enter into an altered state of consciousness. But this can only be achieved achieved through the guidance of someone experienced in free improvisation. So you have this combination of a ill-defined amount of practice that you have to engage in, a virtuosity in your instrument, and this ill-defined mysticism. And these stop us as audience members of free improvisation becoming free improvisers just as we couldn't become artists and how under capitalism a worker is always a worker and never the boss. We are forever left in this position whereby we are audiences interpreting the work and extracting some kind of meaning from it. So at this point in my original talk I had a slide which showed what happened during some of the improvisations. But that was a distraction from the main point. I was really interested at this point in what I meant to be an artist engaging in this and what an artist's role, both as a creator of meaning and as someone who might be involved in a liberatory practice might be. So, what did I discover in terms of this? Well, I've subtitled this saying goodbye to the socialist Napoleon and learning to withdraw the self. So what I did is that I analysed my experience through a form of critical autoethnography, developed through readings of Monaco's work and memory work and fan ethnography, McKinley's writings and critical autoethnography, and Sixth's Bathsheba or the Interior Bible. And what I came to find is that the first step in liberating others is to recognise the ways we inhabit and enact hierarchies as artists and to withdraw from these. We, we need to withdraw from our work 
enough to give audiences a space to move into. So if we want to question the role of ourselves as the mediators of meaning and to allow audiences to engage in this process, then we have to withdraw from our own work. But we also have to be careful that we don't see ourselves as leaders within this, that we are not guiding our audiences, but rather that we are members of, in this case, an ensemble, a collection of people improvising together and a collection of people striving for some sort of liberation. And this is where the idea of the Socialist Napoleon comes in. This is from Conquest of Bread, where Kropopkin talks about how the early utopian socialists had no way to enact their socialist plans and waited on some great Napoleon to do it for them. And we have to be careful that we did not become this socialist Napoleon, that we continue to be members of a group rather than its leaders. In terms of the Fier may have put it, the we, where he talked about becoming a teacher student and a student teacher, we become artist audiences and our audiences are audience artists. We try to collapse these hierarchical systems. So how am I moving forward with these ideas? Well, I'm going to be using the knowledge gained from this year long study to begin working in an art which focuses on others. And I'll be investigating this using ethnography, but activist ethnographic models and ideas of liberation pedagogy, because this in the end is again to bring a fear into this and fear in terms of this or in terms relating to the work of bell hooks this is teaching liberation and um, pedagogy in its widest sense and in a liberatory sense it's teaching people to become something other than consumers or workers it's giving them an opportunity to expand and become more fully human to use Fier's phrase. And I'm also going to think about whether ethnography itself can be a form of pedagogy, whether engaging in ethnographic research with a person allows me to use that to become a, itself a form of critical ethnography. And I'll obviously continue to use um, critical autoethnography. And this will all be wrapped up in a system of creating meaning, which wherein there is no inherent finished meaning within the pieces which are created. And the individuals experiencing them create this meaning on their own and the meaning belongs to them. But with all that in mind, I could spend the next three years engaging in this and I might create something great of it, but I'm reminded of Fier when he argued that the radical requirement, both for the individual who discovers himself or herself to be an oppressor and for the oppressed is that the concrete situation that begets oppression must be transformed. So with that in mind, I developed a series of questions that we can use as artists, as academics, and also as audience members. So is our art free of labour? If not, who benefits most from this? Is it us or is it the audiences? Are we centering ourselves or others? And finally, what would it mean to change the ways in which we practice our art to create a non-hierarchical art free of labour? And this brings us full circle back to Cardo again and his argument that progressive ideas must shine like a bright light into the cobwebs of bourgeois ideology and the avant-garde. And I think this is correct, but his argument is that the only way to achieve this 
is to escape the avant-garde. And I hope that I've been able to show that there is a way of doing this from within the avant-garde. Well, thank you for your time. And these are my references. Thank you very much. Sorry, and thank you uh, for the people on Zoom. So what I just said was that um, uh, this is a bit back to front, but I do want to introduce Elizabeth properly before um, uh, we get into the Q&A. So Elizabeth Belden is a sound artist, improviser, and researcher with a particular interest in themes of social justice, autonomy, and liberation. Elizabeth's research focuses on the autonomy of audiences within the musical avant-garde and ways we can rethink our practices to grant agency to audiences reduce the distinction between audiences and artists, and to use art and music as an exercise in liberation um, pedagogy. And so now we'll begin with some questions. Um, um, hi, Elizabeth. Thanks so much um, for that presentation. I was thinking about your um, where you arrived towards the end of your presentation um, at this desire to collapse the distinction between the artist and the audience. And I was wondering if what you're talking about is specific to individual performers, a kind of individualistic notion of creativity and performance and what the implications of what you're talking about would be for collaboratively devised performances where there might be um, that the music might be being created for an audience, but it's also just as much being created collectively or in collaboration with and for each other, um, as much as for a sort of non-participating audience and what, what that does to what you're talking about. Um, am I being heard? Yeah. yeah. Oh, we can't hear you now. Sorry. Oh, no. Is that better? Let me know, Ben, you can hear me. Oh, yeah, we can hear you now. Yes. Okay. So I think that's a very good point. Um, what I've spoken about in this is largely my own work. Um, I'm a well, you may call a solo improviser, I don't tend to work in collaboration with others, but a large part of my work was asking, my write-up for my work was asking questions about what the dynamic for group improvisation is and how issues of how the hierarchy still exists within that, but exists in a way in which the improvisers, the people engaging in improvisation, lock out audiences um, through these kinds of ideas, like um, the that I was talking about, like the idea of how much work you've put into, you know, how many years you've done a practice of that. Um, or this mysticism um, and how we they, uh, it can often end up creating a situation whereby it, it replicates these hierarchies and that if you are admitted into the world of free improviser, if you're given the title free improviser, you're granted an agency which is then denied to the audience and that a lot of how 
collective improvisation is spoken about can mirror this and can even to some extent reify life life free improvisation is almost a, a ritual an enactment of if, if I'm, I'm i'm sure most people have probably read the um the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction but um, this idea of an essence within the work a kind of how to describe it it's almost like what the writing and free improvisation creates as absolutely ritualistic and absolutely locking people out distancing them from the work and creating a situation wherein we again are asked to observe the work to create meaning from the work and our labor in that sense is extracted by the work to give the work meaning and validity. I hope that answers your question. It's a, a nod from, from Amanda who asked that question. Um, Elizabeth, I, I might ask a question as a follow-up um, to that last point you were making. Throughout your presentation, I was trying to sort of think about the act of listening and when listening is labor and when it's not. And I'm not sure that um, that I can pinpoint it, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts. Hmm. I think that's actually a very good question. Um, I don't think it's easy to pinpoint an exact point wherein the act of listening becomes labor. I think that not so much the act of listening, but the way that the relationship of the listener to the performer is enacted and how these hierarchies and power relationships come into being can constitute the point at which listening becomes labor. Thanks for that. Other questions? Um, just looking and also on Zoom. Um, and Elizabeth, you started to talk about your plans for um, the next couple of years and sort of seeking out this um, this new kind of art practice. Is, are there any glimpses you can you can give us, or any ideas that you're thinking about that are that seem um, to have a lot of potential for you at the moment? Well, there's a particular work that I've created which will probably end up being kind of the basis of my study in this. And it's an installation called RGB, um, which is based upon the idea of the RGB additive color mixing model. So this is an idea, well, not an idea, it's a model whereby through the combination of red, green, and blue, you can basically create any color based on the intensity of each of those colors. So. This work would consist of three films, one red, one green, one blue, which each have a sound source attached to them. And these would be positioned within a room and audiences would be encouraged to come in and move around the room and find a space where they find a sound, a mixture of these three sounds, which they find pleasant or meaningful. And in doing so, they've created a colour. But that isn't inherent within the piece itself. I'm not giving them that. They create the meaning from the piece and then they're encouraged to share their colour, to name it and share it with other people and open up a dialogue that way. That sounds fascinating. Yeah, thanks, thanks for sharing that with us. Are there any more questions? Okay, well, please join me in thanking Elizabeth again for her presentation. And that brings us to the end of the first day of the Reimagining Musical Programming Symposium. Thanks to everyone who has stuck it out until uh, the end of today. And we
we will see you bright and early at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning for the kickoff of day two. That's you people on Zoom as well. So the Zoomies and the Roomies. Okay, see you tomorrow. Thanks.